What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're going to be talking about pheochromocytoma. This is a part of our clinical medicine section. If you guys like this video, it makes sense. It helps you. Please support us. You can do that by hitting the like button, commenting down in the comment section, and please subscribe. Also, take the chance. I really think that you guys will benefit from this. If you go, go down the description box below, there's a link to our website. On our website, if you become a member, you'll have access to tons of notes, thousands of illustrations, thousands of quiz questions, and on top of that, we're even developing exam prep courses for things like the NCLEX, the PANTS, the Step 1, Step 2, etc. So go check those out. All right, let's talk about pheochromocytoma. This is actually not too bad of a topic. So when we talk about pheochromocytoma, the real pathophysiology behind this disease is that there is a source, usually a tumor, that is pumping out tons of catecholamines. The two sources where it usually comes from is the adrenal medulla and these like chromaffin cells that are usually around the aorta, all right? So we'll talk about these two. So one is it's going to be the adrenal medulla. So you have two adrenal glands, but the adrenal medulla is going to be this inner juicy center here of this gland. So this is gonna be one source of where there is a ton of catecholamine synthesis. Another source is going to be usually around the aorta. So here's your aorta, and then right around the bifurcation. So you have, here you have the celiac artery or the celiac trunk, the superior mesenteric artery, the inferior mesenteric artery, and then you go to the bifurcation. Here at the bifurcation, you have these chunks of chromaffin-like cells, and this is called the organ of Zucker candle. Now the organ of Zucker candle is also an area where there's tons of catecholamine synthesis. So here's the concept. In pheochromocytoma, what's really happening is that if we were to zoom in to these two particular tissues, oftentimes your body takes a molecule called tyrosine. And tyrosine is an amino acid that eventually gets converted to something called dopa. And then it gets converted into something called dopamine. And then dopamine is eventually converted into something called norepinephrine, and then eventually it can be converted into another molecule called epinephrine. So what happens in these patients who have the organ of Zucker candle and the adrenal medulla is there's an increase in the activity. So there's an increased activity of the organ of Zucker candle or an increased activity in the adrenal medulla. And what happens is, is tyrosine is being converted into dopa. Dopa is being converted into dopamine. And dopamine is really being shunted into making norepinephrine, and then norepinephrine can be shunted into making tons of epinephrine. So what happens in this pathway is you really increase the synthesis of norepinephrine and epinephrine. Here's the thing though. One of the concepts here that is really important is norepinephrine and epinephrine in the presence of a very specific enzyme, it's called catechol O-methyltransferase. It's a cute little guy, and this enzyme, if you wanna look at it like this, here's this enzyme. What it does is catechol O-methyltransferase helps to be able to take and convert these catecholamines, such as epinephrine and norepinephrine, converting them into their breakdown products. And this is actually super crucial for your exam, particularly when it comes to the diagnostic section. And they can be converted into these like breakdown products called norm, uh, what's called normetanephrine and metanephrine. Now, when you have an increase in this pathway, you'll also have an increase in this byproduct metabolism, such as an increase in normetanephrine and an increase in metanephrine. And so sometimes these are helpful with a diagnostic utility because they can be excreted in the urine or they can be elevated in the bloodstream. And that's not very many diseases that will increase the levels of these. So what we've understood now is that in a patient with pheochromocytoma, there's usually an increase in adrenal medulla activity or an increase in the organ of Zucker candle activity leading to increased norepinephrine, epinephrine, and as a result, byproduct formation of these molecules. The question stands, what's triggering the increased activity of the organ of Zucker candle and what's increasing the activity of the adrenal medulla? Let's come down. It's actually not too bad, thank goodness. That's usually a tumor of the adrenal medulla. 90% of cases, 90% of cases, it's usually some type of tumor of the adrenal medulla.
And there are these cells that make it up. You know there's these cells, they're called the chromaffin cells. What happens is this becomes a really nasty tumor and this tumor will then, as a result, pump out what we've been talking about, heavy levels of norepinephrine and heavy levels of epinephrine. Now, oftentimes, it's usually paroxysmal, meaning that it occurs intermittently. It's more transient. And we'll talk about some of the triggers for that paroxysmal intermittent release of norepinephrine and epinephrine. One thing I need you to remember, though, is that this is by far the most common source or localized area of where massive catecholamine release is occurring. In small amounts of cases, usually maybe 10% of cases, you can have the tumors that form from that organ of Zucker candle. These are chromaffin cells as well, and they're kind of like forming around different parts of the aorta. If it becomes tumorous and it starts secreting large amounts of norepinephrine, and epinephrine, now we refer to this as a tumor that's now secreting these called a paraganglioma. So again, high levels of norepinephrine or epinephrine due to not an adrenal medulla tumor, an extra adrenal tumor like a paraganglioma could also account for this massive catecholamine synthesis and release. The thing that you have to start asking the question of with pheochromocytomas, if this is the most common case, what's causing the tumor to be formed? Oftentimes, it's sporadic. We don't really know. But there's this interesting concept that helps you with the exam, that sometimes we can use this trick to remember some of the components of adrenal, I'm sorry, pheochromocytoma. One of the aspects of it is that 10% of cases could be genetic. That means that there could be a mutation, and there is many different types of mutations. I think the most important one to remember is what's called MEN2, and there's two different types, MEN2A and MEN2B. MEN2A is, if you guys remember, it was 1M and 2Ps, medullary thyroid cancer, pheochromocytoma, and hypoparathyroidism. MEN2B is 2Ms, and usually with this one, you also remember that there's one P. So it's usually a morphinoid body habitus, medullary thyroid cancer, and pheochromocytoma. Do you notice how in both of these, pheochromocytoma is present? So you can have multiple other endocrine systems that are being affected in MEN2A and MEN2B. That is a very small amount of cases. And even smaller than that, it could be due to these other mutations and what's called the von Hippel-Lindau gene or the neurofibromatosis type 1 gene. So if you have mutations that are present in these genes, it does increase the risk of having tumors, particularly of the adrenal medulla. But it's more commonly sporadic. 90% of cases will be sporadic. And so you can remember, rule of tens, it means that 10% of the causes of pheochromocytoma is usually going to be genetic. The other concept here is that it also can be benign, and generally 90% of cases, malignant in 10% of cases. So 10% of cases, this could be malignant. The other concept is that most commonly these tumors are in adults. They don't commonly occur in children. So in 10% of cases, this may occur in children. And we'll put all this together in the end, I promise. But 10% occur in ch children, 10% malignant, 10% are usually due to genetic mutation. The last thing is that 10% are bilateral adrenal involvement. So as you can see, that's, again, 10% of cases will they be both adrenal medullas being involved. So then what you can surmise out of this is, 90% of cases of pheochromocytoma, where the tumor in the adrenal medulla occurs, is sporadic. 90% of cases are benign. 90% of cases occur in adults, and 90% of cases are usually unilateral. And that's really important when we talk about this with respect to pheo. So now that we've gone over that pheochromocytoma is a massive increase in catecholamines and their byproducts due to an adrenal medulla tumor or a periganglioma, where 10% of cases are genetic, malignant, children, and bilateral, now let's talk about what are the devastating effects of high levels of catecholamines.
I'm your friend, so now we're going to talk about the complications and the classic findings of patients who come in with a pheochromocytoma. So we know now the pathophysiology is pretty straightforward. There's either an adrenal medulla tumor or there's a paraganglioma pumping out tons of norepinephrine, epinephrine. There's a lot of byproducts that are being produced as a result of that increased synthesis. And we know that it's most of the time unilateral, benign in adults. And again, it's usually within the adrenal medulla and it's sporadic. With that being said, how do they present? Well, there's usually a classic triad, and that classic triad of presentation is usually headaches, palpitations, and diaphoresis. And it's not all the time, it's usually intermittent, it's paroxysmal, and it just comes about. And there's certain triggers, we'll talk about those certain triggers a little bit later. But oftentimes, these are the three most common manifestations. So let's talk about that, headache. So headache is actually due to, again, norepinephrine and epinephrine are being produced in high amounts. Whenever they're produced in high amounts, they act on two different sites. One is they can act on the beta receptor system, and they can act on the alpha-1 receptor system. Either way, in both of these systems, let's say that it works to stimulate the beta-1 receptors, and it works to stimulate the alpha-1 receptors. So you get increased alpha-1 receptor activity, and you get increased beta-1 receptor activity. With both of these pathways, beta-1 increases the conduction. So it's going to increase the speed of action potentials through the SA node, AV node, bundle of Hiss, uh, right and left bundle branches, Purkinje system, and your heart rate will go up. On top of that, it'll also act on the contractile myocardium and increase contractility. The combination of an increase in heart rate and increase in contractility leads to an increase in your cardiac output. So oftentimes, we'll have an increase in cardiac output and we know that as cardiac output goes up, so does blood pressure. So from this, we will see that the patient will have an increase in their blood pressure. On top of that, whenever you activate alpha-1 receptors, they cause squeezing of the arteries. So when they squeeze the arteries, vasoconstriction, you narrow the lumen, you reduce the lumen diameter, and increase resistance. So these patients will experience what's called a increase in systemic vascular resistance. With that increase in systemic vascular resistance comes a increase in blood pressure. When you have this massive transient increased rise in blood pressure, it'll cause increased perfusion to the brain. That transient period of where there is an increase in brain perfusion may trigger a secondary headache. Because sometimes what happens is your brain creates this like autoregulatory mechanism. When the blood pressure is really high, your brain actually tries to protect it, and so it creates these different types of cerebral vascular changes. Either way, this perfusion to the brain is altered. So there's altered brain perfusion. And that altered brain perfusion will lead to this formation of a headache. So that's oftentimes one very common manifestation that we will see in these patients. So look for a headache. The next thing is palpitations. It's actually a similar concept. When you have lots of norepinephrine and lots of epinephrine, this primary effect is it's going to really hit those beta-1 receptors. Now, when I really hit those beta-1 receptors, I massively stimulate the beta-1 receptor activity. Again, what that's going to do is, is it's going to increase the contractility. Right? So I'll write that down. It's going to increase contractility. Now, whenever I squeeze my heart really hard and try to bang blood out of it, it sometimes can create this very uncomfortable sensation, right, that we refer to as palpitations, because your heart's really jamming and trying to smash blood out of it. So that's one thing, is that increase in stroke volume can make it seem as though your heart is really working hard and make you kind of have an un, a undesirable awareness of that unpleasant sensation. The other concept here, is that when you activate the beta-1 receptors, you increase the speed of conduction. So now, I'm gonna have faster AV node conduction. I'm gonna have, as a result, an increase in my heart rate. So I may even have a little bit of a tachycardia as a result. And that increase in heart rate, secondary to a increase in AV node conduction, this combination will lead to the unpleasant awareness of our heart beating and also contracting. And that's where we see these concepts of palpitations. The last concept here is going to be diaphoresis. So this one's actually not super as well understood, but the concept behind this one 
is that norepinephrine and epinephrine, when released in very high amounts, may have a twofold effect. One effect is that they may go and kind of upregulate the activity of the hypothalamus. So you know the hypothalamus plays a huge role in our body temperature. And so sometimes these high levels of catecholamines may trigger our body's thermostat to become out of order, if you will, and it may trigger an increase in our body temperature, our internal body temperature. So what may happen is, as I activate the hypothalamus, the hypothalamus and result to this change will try to increase my body's internal temperature. Whenever you increase your body temperature, what's a natural mechanism? Like right now, in this office right now, I'm sweating. It's because my body temperature is kind of going up. And so that's usually a very common response. So an increase in body temperature may lead to an activation of the eccrine sweat glands, which in response leads to sweat production. That's one mechanism. The other mechanism we don't necessarily have a great idea of, but somehow, this increased norepinephrine and epinephrine may lead to a release of acetylcholine from certain nerve fibers that supply the eccrine sweat glands. So now whenever acetylcholine is released in these larger amounts at the eccrine sweat glands, it will then directly stimulate the sweat glands to produce sweat. So this is the two concepts that we believe are triggering an increase in sweat production. It's hypothalamic activation and an increase in acetylcholine, but either way, we're activating the sweat glands. With that being said, when a patient has a pheochromocytoma, we worry about that adrenal tumor just pumping out norepinephrine and epinephrine. And now there's a couple different triggers for this. Now, three big triggers that really puts a patient into this scary complication called hypertensive crisis is these three triggers. One is there's some type of abdominal manipulation. Maybe they're getting a surgical procedure. That's a very common one, right? So they're getting a surgery. When they're getting a surgery in the abdomen, maybe for some reason they compress the adrenal medulla. And from the compression of the adrenal medulla, this leads to kind of your squeezing or milking the tumor and causing it to release norepinephrine and epinephrine. And that cause a transient and quick rise in norepinephrine and epinephrine levels, leading to palpitations, headache, and sweating. Now, that's one reason we could see this. The second reason we may also see a hypertensive crisis is another one. We say that it could be due to beta blocker therapy. And the concept behind this is that when a patient is having a pheochromocytoma, they're releasing norepinephrine and epinephrine. There's two different types of receptors. There's a beta-2 receptor, and there's a alpha-1 receptor. Now, when you give a beta blocker, right, you're going to be hitting the beta-2 receptors. And so imagine here, I give a drug that hits the beta-2 receptors. Well, beta-2 receptors want to promote vasodilation. If you block that, you block vasodilation. So as a response here, I get no vasodilatory effect. So then, all the norepinephrine and epinephrine that's been released within the body from the adrenal medulla tumor or the periganglioma can just go ahead and bind onto this alpha-1 receptor. And what will it do? It'll squeeze the heck out of the vessel. That's gonna cause all unopposed alpha-1 vasoconstriction because beta blockers are blocking the beta-2 receptor. So now I have no vasodilation. So what you'll get out of this is you'll get pure increase in SVR, vasoconstriction because there will be no vasodilation. No vasodilation. Because again, you're blocking, as an effect here, you are blocking the beta-2 receptor. And then all the norepinephrine and epinephrine will bind onto the alpha-1 receptor and cause intense vasoconstriction. That's one mechanism. The last one is actually kind of scary. We don't use these as much anymore, monoamine oxidase inhibitors. They used to be used in depression. But the concept behind this is that whenever you give tyramine, so tyramine is usually in cheese and chocolate and red wine and things like that. Tyramine, you guys remember this pathway? I mentioned it for a reason. It wasn't for nothing. It gets converted into dopa. Then it gets converted into dopamine. And then that gets converted into norepinephrine. And then it gets converted into epinephrine. All right, this was the pathway. So if I give somebody food that is rich in tyramine, I'll increase the synthesis of tyramine, dopa, 
dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. Then what I'll do is in the combination to that, I will also give particular molecules that will inhibit these enzymes. This is an enzyme called a monoamine oxidase. And what they do is they try to break down the norepinephrine and the epinephrine. But if I give them this drug, I will inhibit these enzymes and these will not be broken down. And as a result, norepinephrine and epinephrine levels will shoot up. So the concept that really comes out of all of these is that you either squeeze the tumor from abdominal manipulation like a surgery, you give a beta blocker which allows all the norepinephrine and epinephrine in the body to only bind onto alpha-1 receptors, or you give them monoamine oxidase inhibitors and tyramine, leading to an increase in norepinephrine and epinephrine release. Either way, what's the downside of all of this? Well, the problem here is, is that whenever you have massive amounts, and we've kind of already covered this a little bit, norepinephrine and epinephrine, this will hit the beta-1 receptors. And we already talked about what this will do. So if it hits those beta-1 receptors, what's the concept here? Hits the beta-1 receptors, your increase in beta-1 receptor activity will lead to what? An increase in heart rate. So we already know that. Okay. The other concept is that as you increase your heart rate, what else do you do to your cardiac output? You increase cardiac output. And then as a result, you increase blood pressure. All right, cool. So from this, I'm definitely able to surmise how blood pressure goes up. If I have lots of epinephrine and norepinephrine, my heart rate will go up and so will my blood pressure. The other concept <laughs> is that norepinephrine and epinephrine will also work on these alpha-1 receptors. So if I act on these alpha-1 receptors, then I'm going to stimulate these puppies that's going to increase my systemic vascular resistance. I'm going to squeeze the heck out of these blood vessels. If I squeeze the heck out of these blood vessels, I'm going to therefore reduce the diameter and increase resistance, and the blood pressure will shoot up. Either way, I'm leading to an increase in blood pressure. How do we truly define a hypertensive crisis? This is truly defined as whenever a patient has a blood pressure where it is greater than 1 80 over 120. Here's the thing. I can even go a step further. I can determine if it's an emergency or an urgency. Because if the patient has target organ damage, so let's say that they have target organ damage. The question is, do they have that? If they do have target organ damage, or if they don't have target organ damage, we give it a specific definition. If they do, it's a hypertensive emergency. This is a serious scenario and they need IV medications and we gotta start kinda getting their blood pressure down a little bit. If there is no target organ damage, then it's a hypertensive urgency and there is no rush in trying to really get their blood pressure down a little bit. How do we determine the target organ damage factor? Well, if you guys remember from the hypertension video, we kinda of determine based upon the presence of, is there encephalopathy? In other words, do they have confusion, right? That's definitely one factor. And sometimes this can be so bad that it even causes bleeds in the brain. So you also wanna watch out for things like ICHs and subarachnoid hemorrhages. So intracerebral hemorrhage, subarachnoid hemorrhage, these are definitely complications. The other thing is you don't want the blood pressure to be so high that you cause so much stress on the myocardium that it, it, the demand is really high. And you, if you have a stable plaque there, you may not get enough perfusion to the myocardium. And so these patients are also at high risk for myocardial ischemia. Not a STEMI per se, but more likely a N-STEMI. The other thing is that sometimes you can cause the patients when the blood pressure is so high, they can't squeeze enough blood out of their left heart because the afterload's too high. As a result, blood backs up into the left atrium, into the pulmonary veins, and then eventually the problem is it can back up into the lungs. So sometimes this can even be a trigger to put a patient into acute heart failure. And then if you go into acute heart failure, that fluid can back up into the lungs and lead to pulmonary edema. So some of the things that you have to watch out for in these patients who come in with a BP greater than 180 over 120 is, do they have confusion? Do they have neurological deficits? Do they have an increase in their troponin and ST depressions or T-wave inversions on their ECG?
Do they have pulmonary edema? If they do, you really want to think, okay, what could be the trigger? And one of those scenarios is it could be a pheochromocytoma. And you have to think, were they on a monoamine oxidase inhibitor with tyramine use? Were they having a beta blocker that they just started? Or was there some type of recent abdominal surgery or manipulation that occurred? And then you got to start thinking about how do I go about diagnosing this? Let's talk about that now. Now, in a patient who comes in and they come in like maybe they have intermittent periods of palpitations, sweating, um, they have headaches, they also have a blood pressure of greater than 180 over 120, and it just doesn't seem right. Oftentimes in these patients, you'll work them up for causes of secondary hypertension. In this patient, I think the first thing to do is if you think that they could have a pheochromocytoma, especially in the scenario of a hypertensive crisis, is obtain a urinary and serum metanephrine. Okay. Where did that come from? Oh, Zach, you said that whenever there's a high amount of norepinephrine, it can get metabolized into normetanephrine. And whenever you have a lot of epinephrine, that gets metabolized into metanephrines. And those are in the blood and the urine. There you go. If I test these and they're very high, there's not many diseases that do that. So if there's high serum and urine metanephrines, it definitely gives me a concept that there's probably a pheochromocytoma here. I just need to figure out if it's intra-adrenal uh, or extra-adrenal. And if I get an adrenal CT MRI, I'll be able to tell, oh, there it is. It's unilateral. It's, it's likely in the adrenal gland. Therefore, it's probably benign. It's in an adult. This is likely going to be a sporadic mutation. If it was outside of the adrenal gland, like near the aorta, and on top of that, they were young, uh, it definitely has the potential to metastasize, and they have like maybe a genetic mutation that I'm concerned of, then I would work them up for MEN2A, MEN2B, uh, neurofibromatosis, or von Hepel-Lindau gene mutations. But in this scenario, it's probably sporadic. With that being said, I've diagnosed a pheochromocytoma. That's not too bad, right? I think it's an important thing to remember, though, that this test can be altered. Uh, you have to make sure that you're doing specific things, like you can't be apply, applying any kind of abdominal manipulation. The patient has to be laying flat when you do this. So there's a lot of kind of stipulations to making sure that this test is completely accurate. All right, so let's now talk about the treatment of pheochromocytoma. So when a patient who has a pheochromocytoma, the problem is the adrenal medulla tumor. I have to cut that thing out, right? So oftentimes the best thing that you can do is get that thing out by doing an adrenalectomy. So you're gonna cut the adrenal gland out, but the problem is, is that the veins that are actually connected to it, you have to ligate those off because any residual amount of norepinephrine or epinephrine that's in that area can start leaking out into the bloodstream. So you ligate out those vessels, you then cut out the adrenal gland, all right? Problem is, is I already told you that I don't want to put this patient to a hypertensive crisis because I told you the trigger oftentimes to trigger that profuse release of norepinephrine epinephrine could be surgical or abdominal manipulation, beta blockers, or the monoamine oxidase and tyramine use. So I cannot send this patient to a surgical procedure without actually suppressing the massive sympathetic storm that they will have. So how do I do that? I got to block the alpha receptors and the beta receptors. So what I'll do is, is I'll schedule the patient, maybe I'm gonna plan a patient to have a, the, you know, the adrenalectomy in 14 days, all right? 14 days from that time point, I'm gonna start them on preoperative phenoxybenzamine. Phenoxybenzamine is actually pretty cool because what it does is it blocks the alpha one receptors. Then as a result, norepinephrine, epinephrine can't bind to it. If that can't happen, they can't squeeze the vessels, the resistance will go down and so will the blood pressure. So you'll prevent a hypertensive crisis in that form. But there's also another site there's another site where norepinephrine, epinephrine can bind to, the beta-1 receptors in the heart. So then what I'm going to do is eventually I'll say, okay, three days before they get their surgery, I'm going to suppress the beta-1 receptors, and I'm going to put them on propanolol. Propanolol will then go ahead and block the beta-1 receptors on the heart, and if I do that, I will reduce the conduction of electrical activity and reduce their heart rate and therefore reduce their blood pressure. All right? So that's how we would treat a patient with pheochromocytoma. I really hope that this made sense. I hope that you guys did enjoy it. Love you, thank you, and as always, until next time.